The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Later in the program, we will bring you an important message from J. Edgar Hoover on our nation's internal security. A shrewd psychologist who has had contacts with numerous leaders of American business once remarked, Success and self-confidence go hand in hand. Men who have a strong conviction that they're going to succeed are the ones who rise to the top in every field. For people of this type, people who have this feeling of certainty about themselves, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has created its famous life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Do those words describe you? Then you'll be interested in about 14 minutes when I give full details of the Equitable Plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Flight to Avoid Prosecution. It's titled, The Big Fix. Recent investigations give very definite indication that organized crime in the United States today is conducted with great efficiency. Like any business, Its purpose is to keep income large and expenses small. One expense which cannot be cut by organized crime is the money it pays for political protection. The plain truth is that it cannot operate successfully anywhere without protection. And both the corrupt politicians and the hoodlums know that. Tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was chosen because it illustrates the direct tie-up between the two factions. This case presents a situation prevalent in many communities, maybe in yours. Tonight's file opens on the main street of one of America's tropical island possessions. It is late afternoon and at a sidewalk cafe, a heavy set man in a white linen suit sits alone at a corner table, scowling at his tall drink of local rum. Hi. Hi. Gee, kid, I've been, I've been looking all over town for you. I got something red hot, Artie. We can make a bundle. Hey, Carrizo. Carrizo, come here. Okay. What have you got now? Terrific proposition. Hey, Carrizo, this is Mr. Sherman. Greetings, Mr. Sherman. Rip, get this bum out of hey, here. Hey, will you listen to proposition? You see that bird he's got on his arm? Well, Carrizo's got him fighting tonight at the pit. Tell him about it, Carrizo. He fight cheaper from other islands. Yeah, and wait till you hear. We can win a bet. You see, these guys go pretty good when they like a bird. And off the form, Carrizo's ought to be one to five. I wouldn't bet on him if he was fighting a worm. Yeah, but that's the idea. He's going to be big chalk. And I got Carrizo to fix it so he takes a dive. See, si, see. Si. I feed him just before the fight. That make him slow. Other bird win. <laughs> Easy. How about that? We can go bet ourselves a chunk. Rip. And, uh, Tell him to blow. Oh, now, wait a minute. You think it's easy to dig up a bird? It'll go into the tank? I had to work on this guy. I said get out of here. Go on, blow. Hey, see, senor, see? Never again I make bargains with crazy people. Rip, what are you trying to do to me? There's just nothing, nothing, nothing. Take it easy, Artie. Forget about the bird. Hey, I got a thing for Sunday, a sure bet. We can get the guy with the favorite in the sailboat race to snag his boat. Rip, and I... I'm sick of fixing things. I'm also sick of eating banana bread, banana pie, banana stew. In fact, I'm sick of this whole island. I'm going back to the States. Oh, Artie, let's not start that again. We made a deal with Borden and Fisher. Look, if they can't fix one witness in a year, they'll never fix him. Where are you going? Send Connie a cable. Well, what's the rush? Boat came in this morning. Leaves here Sunday. When it sails, we're going to be on it. A few days later, in an eastern city in the United States, warm spring sunshine beats down on an old frame house that is surrounded by a coal yard. 
Inside the ground floor office, two gray-haired men sit near the window. Miles? Hmm? It says here we're to be investigating. Again? Yeah. The mayor said today he pro proposes to go into the deal Miles Borden and Horace Fisher have to sell the city schools their coal. It will be recalled that Borden and Fisher's political machine was wrecked by the mayor's recent election. Really say that? Right here in Joe Kinney's column. Horace, I thought you knew better. Hmm? Last time he was right, they, they give him a week off to get over it. <laughs> Why, that man's got as much chance learning by reading them columns as a, a racing dog has trying to catch the rabbit. <laughs> 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 no charge, Vandran. <laughs> well, morning, Connie. Hi. Yeah, good to see you, my dear. I just got your message. Well, now, you're real prompt. What do you want? Well, uh, <clears throat> me and Horace got to playing a game. You know, trying to guess who you'd get a cable from. <laughs> and we figured it had to be from Artie. How'd you know I got one? Connie? The birds didn't hear that we lost the election. You know, they, they still sit on them telephone wires and they come right to me or Horace with the messages. <laughs> okay, okay. I got one and it was for Marty. Uh, he's aching to come home, ain't he? Uh-huh. Well, there'll be trouble brewing the minute him and Rip get back. Why? They've been gone over a year. Yes, I know, but going away for a year don't mean that they forgive you for murder. Not with the new mayor. If there's two people that the mayor would like to see, it's Artie and Rip. <laughs> and he'd like to see us sharing the same cell with him. What's all this got to do with me? I don't guess it'd be too good for you to have Artie back. Why not? You remember them birds on the wires? You and Pete Simon started being loyal to Artie the minute he left. You were so loyal that you were together all the time. Artie won't like that, Connie. That's over now. Artie will never find out. You know, it's strange who them birds will talk to. That's why we got to stop cutting bait. We're all in it, and we got to work together. Wait a minute. I still like Artie, and I'm not crossing him. Now, what's on your mind? All we want you to do is to send the boy a cable. What's it supposed to say? We got it all wrote down for you. Yeah. All you got to do is go to the cable office and give it to him. <laughs> it's easier than voting a straight ticket. <laughs> Meanwhile, at police headquarters in the same city... FBI Special Agent Taylor approaches the desk of Detective Harry Parker. Hello, Harry. Oh, hi, Jim. All those papers for me? No. No, I've just got several more cases assigned to me. Oh. The agent who's been handling them up to now was transferred last week. Well, can I help? Yeah, you might on one. I noticed from the previous reports you worked on this case here. Oh, the Artie Sherman Rip Randall killing. Yeah. I'll say I worked on it. Well, according to the first report, Harry, our jurisdiction came when they crossed the state line to avoid prosecution. That's right. We had definite proof they were in New York after the murder. What were the actual details of the murder, Harry? You came here after they left, didn't you? Yeah, about, oh, three months after. Mm-hmm. Artie Sherman controlled the slot machines in this county up to the last election. Uh -huh. Miles Borden and Horace Fisher were protecting him here in town and had all of us at headquarters well handcuffed. Then, when the reform crowd was elected, we cleaned out every slot in the city. Well, Sherman still had them in the rest of the county, though, as I understand. Still had and still has. Ah. Well, anyway, about 15 months ago, right after election, the grand jury started to investigate Sherman's political protection. They had one very good witness who was willing to talk. The night before he was to testify, Sherman and Randall shot and killed him. Have you definite proof of this? We've got an eyewitness. A man named Martin Cross saw Sherman and Randall fire the shots. He made positive identification. This uh, last report here, 45 days ago, says there's been no word of them since they left. Uh-huh. You can copy that same sentence. Ah. Well, I'm on the case now, so I'd appreciate you calling if you do get any. Sure, Jim. Oh, have you got some time for some coffee before you go? No, thanks. I have three other cases I want to work on right away, and I have some appointments. So call me, Harry.
Artie, I've been looking all over the boat for you. We got action. Yeah. Hey, you know that guy you played shuffleboard with this morning? Uh-huh. Well, play him again tomorrow. But make him shoot the dark ones. Why? Well, I had him shaved so they ain't round. He'll be throwing curves. You are a genius. Yeah, okay. Well, try this one on for size. I made a connection in the engine room. For what? Well, you know that, that raffle thing where everybody on the boat guesses how far we're going to go in a day? Yeah, the ship's pool. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, these guys in the engine room got friendly, and I made them a proposition. And they said they'll see to it that we win in the pool. Oh, pardon me, sir. Hmm? This radiogram was just received. Oh, thanks. Here. Uh, thank you, sir. Who's it from? Connie. She says, convinced your friends you had to come back. They feel man may be reached. We'll meet you at pier and explain love and kisses. Hey, that's sensational. Yeah. Oh, boy. That'll be great getting home again. It ain't just being patriotic, but... Uh, well, there never was a joint like the States for finding things to fix. <laughs> That Sherman case we talked about last week? Yes, Jim. There are some new developments. What happened? I got a call this morning with a tip that Artie Sherman and Rip Randall were back. Who called? He wouldn't give his name, but he said they returned on the SS Holiday. Mm -hmm. I went to the pier and checked. Sherman and Randall were passengers, all right. Well, no wonder we never found them around here. The taxi starters don't remember seeing either one, and no luggage in their name is being forwarded anywhere, so the tip doesn't mean too much. Well, at least we know they're back. That's worth something. Yeah. Harry, we'd better alert all hotels. Right. And while we're watching every one of Sherman's and Randall's old hangouts, the sheriff's office will handle the rest of the county. How about Sherman's old girl? Well, I haven't had a chance to see her yet or talk to that witness, uh, uh... Martin Cross? Yeah, Cross. I think we ought to notify him that Sherman's back in the country. He'll need some protection. Yeah, I guess you're right. We can take care of that. And Sherman's girl is at the Sentry Hotel, isn't she? The last I heard she did. You want me to go see her? Yeah, will you? I'll visit Mr. Cross. <laughs> Charge for entering. Well, howdy, Connie. Oh, I'm as tired as you two look. Those two extra votes come back? <laughs> extra votes? <laughs> uh, you kill him, don't you? <laughs> Funniest man ever lived. <laughs> Tell us about the traveling man. <laughs> well, I met Artie at the boat this morning. and Just, just... Artie? No, him and Rip. We threw the bags into the car and I started driving up the Bay Highway. When I turned on to it, they both yelled. Why? They wanted to come into town. But you were supposed to tell them that. Miles, Artie ain't the easiest fella to explain something to. I told him it'd only be a week or so before you got it all straight. But you know him, he wants action. Mm, hard man to please. Well, we finally got to Bay City, and they cooled off a little when they saw the lodge. I think they'll be okay. Yeah, Artie's lucky to have a smart girl like you. Don't throw your charm at me. Save it for them if you don't get that witness fixed by next week. He'll be fixed. That for sure? Well, if he ain't, come next election, me and Horace will only vote once. <laughs> <laughs> what about that, Gunny? <laughs> Very funny. Okay, I'll call and tell him. See you soon. <laughs> Things going just the way you said, Miles. You got that lighter? In my pocket, safe as a baby. Uh, and a gun? My boy's carrying one in the car. Well, maybe I ought to go with you. Oh, no need for it, Miles, no need. Guess I'm old enough to know how to take care of a witness. <laughs> We will return shortly to tonight's case from the official files of your FBI. Now for a moment, let's consider an entirely different type of case. The case of Jimmy Carlton, an ambitious fellow who worked in a factory. Jim and his wife had one big dream, to own their own home. After years of saving, their dream came true. Three weeks later, Jim walked into the new house and told his wife, Mary, that he had sold it. 
she was brokenhearted. The fact that Jim had sold it at a nice profit helped heal her heart. So they bought another, and the same thing happened. Say, Jim, how did this thing turn out? Well, I kept buying and selling houses so often that I quit the factory job. Today, I'm a licensed real estate man. Some years ago, Jim's Equitable Society representative spotted him as a fellow who was bound to get ahead. So he told him about the Equitable Plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of any age who dream of success and work to make their dreams come true. The Equitable Plan is different from other life insurance plans. It's flexible. It's like a rubber band around your income. When your income gets bigger, this plan can stretch. In other words, it's life insurance that grows as you grow. This year, I got some good commissions, so I figured it was a good time to take advantage of one of the options in my equitable plan and get my insurance in step with my new earnings. And there's another big advantage to this equitable plan. Until you get ahead in your job, until you make more money, the cost of this plan can be kept exceptionally low. Yet your family gets the life insurance protection they need. When I was earning a lot less, my equitable plan cost a lot less. So my life insurance never got to be a burden. Are you planning to get ahead? Sure you are. So why not do what Jimmy did? Ask your Equitable Society representative about the equitable plan for men and women on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E Q U I. T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Big Fix. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you have met a criminal who controlled the slot machine racket and two political bosses who gave him protection. Only one thing makes it possible for an unholy alliance like this to exist, the apathy and indifference of the citizens. For proof, you need look no further than the voting figures. Of a total of 80 million potential voters in this nation, Less than half went to the polls in the last non-presidential election. That's playing directly into the hands of the corrupt politician, for it allows him to control election outcomes with comparatively few votes. The irate citizen who raves and rants against the grafting political machine and then fails to vote on election day is, after all, a fairly ridiculous figure. You, the voter, can help break the power of any political machine and its ability to do business with crime. That is your right, your privilege, and your duty. Tonight's FBI file continues later that night at local police headquarters. Detective Harry Parker is at his desk when the phone rings. Detective Parker. Jim Taylor, Harry. I'm at Mr. Cross's house. While we were talking a few minutes ago, two shots were fired through the window. They hit him? No. No, I've dug both of them out of the wall, but Cross is pretty shaken up by this thing. That's not surprising. I ran out of the door as quickly as I could, but all I saw was a black sedan pulling around the corner. How many men in it? I couldn't tell. Artie Sherman might have done the shooting, though. I found a cigarette lighter near the window. It has uh-huh. Sherman's initials engraved across the face. Um, it reads, uh, to AMS from CM, May 30th, 1945. That's Sherman's birthday. That CM must be Connie Marshall. Oh, did you get to see her? No, she moved from the century, and we're trying to get a new address. I've sent out a lookout order on her. Fine. Now, Harry, if you'll send a man over to guard Mr. Cross, I'll take these bullets to our lab, and I'll call you in the morning as soon as I get a report. No charge for entering. A fine couple of phonies you are. Well, something wrong? You see the morning papers. Well, that's a good picture of Artie. Well, what'd he do now? Don't play cute with me. Horace, it says here that Artie took a couple of shots at that witness. No. He didn't do it, and you two know he didn't. Why, it says so right here. Look, when I left here last night, I called Artie at the lodge. I talked to him at 8.30. The paper says the thing happened at quarter to nine. Well, why don't you go to the cops and tell them? It'd clear him for sure. And nail him for sure. 
They wouldn't like to know where he was when I called him, would they? Mm, I guess that's right. If the witness gets knocked off and they nail Artie for it, you too come out clean. Oh, Connie girl, you're not saying that we'd do a thing like crossing Artie? I certainly am. Miles, I have a suggestion. What's that? Well, this girl's liable to pass her thoughts on to Artie. That's just what I'm going to do. Oh, hold on, dearie. Wait a minute. Miles, we better keep Miss Connie hey. on file in our closet. Marshall girl, Jim. Maybe we'll pick her up with Sherman and Randall. I got another tip. Oh, when? About ten minutes ago. Sounded like the same voice, too. He said Sherman and Rip Randall are at a lodge on Route 7 just outside of Bay City. Are uh, you going up there? No, time is too valuable now, Harry. I just teletyped the state police barracks near Bay City to check on it. The tip said Sherman and Randall had themselves an arsenal and had their minds made up they'd never be taken alive. There are lots of hills around Bay City, Jim. If that lodge is on one of them, it'll be tough to approach. Well, I've warned the troopers to be doubly careful. Oh, you had any report from the sheriff's office? No, not yet. Maybe you'd better check with them, Harry. By that time, I'll probably have some word from the state police. Howdy, can I fix your drink? <laughs> you gotta be all the time fixing something, don't you? That's practice. Sherman and Randall. Howdy. Shut up. Sherman and Randall. Cop's car down the road. Yeah. Sherman and Randall. Sherman and Randall. We know you're in there. You can't get away. Hey, that guy ain't talking from down the road. No, there's a horn out front and some wires leading into the brush. We've been fingered. Yeah. Connie? No, Borden and Fisher, they sent us here. Come out with your hands raised. Come out with your hands raised. If you want us, come and get us. Tear gas. Yeah. Come on, Rip. Right. Out the back way. Stop! Or we'll fire! Keep running, Rip! Yeah. Harry, that tip about Bay City was right. Randall was seriously wounded, but he's at the Bay City Hospital. Sherman got away. How? By boat, he was winged by one of the police, but we don't know how badly. Anybody questioning Randall? Well, he hasn't regained consciousness. Harry, everything has gone too easy on this case. First, we get a tip Sherman and Randall are coming back, and the tip is good. Uh-huh. Then somebody takes a couple of pot shots at the only witness, and we very conveniently find this lighter with Sherman's initials engraved on it. You think it was planted? Well, I don't know, but it's the first lighter I ever saw without fingerprints. Now, if you were Sherman and you sneaked back here, would you advertise you were back by shooting at Martin Cross? No. All right, then we get tip number two, which sounded like it came from the same person, and it turned out to be good. Harry, somebody's gunning for Sherman besides us. Yeah. Borden and Fisher would both be happy if Sherman was out of the way. That's what I'm thinking. There's no point in talking to them, though. Not unless we've got some proof. Wait a minute, Harry. Wait a minute. Maybe we've been overlooking something. We might have a lead right here on this desk. <laughs> Gracious, Horace, I'm full of food. Yeah. <laughs> Such unappetizing food, too. You know, it's difficult sometimes having to patronize a constituent's eating place. <laughs> yes. When should we call Bay City? As soon as we get inside. Well, what about Connie? Should we keep her locked up all night? No point to it. The law has got plenty. I'll get the lights. Who should we call in Bay City? Oh, the local police. Would you like me to get the number? Huh? How'd you get out of that closet? I let her out. Artie, Artie, my boy. Don't give me that con. But it's good to see you. Look, boys, he knows the whole deal. Now, Connie, did you go and tell him that ridiculous story? She didn't have to tell me anything. I already know you guys framed me. Say, boy, you're bleeding. A cop did that. A cop you sent to get me. Oh, now that's pure fabrication. Why don't I go get you a doctor? Stay where you are. Huh? 
I got a gun here. What are you waiting for, Artie? Use it on him. Hold it, Chairman. Huh? Don't take that gun. Leave him alone. I got it. Got it, Jim? Uh, wait yeah, a minute. I got he it. needs a doctor. All right, we'll get him to a doctor. I don't want nothing from cops. Come on, Sherman. Now, wait a minute. Come on. Artie. You better come to me. Artie, let me take your arm. I'm okay. I can walk along. Now, are you two Borden and Fisher? Yes. And we certainly owe a debt of gratitude to you, sir. Well, I don't think you'll feel that way very long. I've got warrants here for your arrest. What for? Your phony attempt at shooting Martin Cross, for one thing. What are you talking about? You planted a lighter that had Sherman's initials on it, but I checked jewelry stores and found out that you had it ordered done just two days ago. That's a lie. Suppose we discuss that at headquarters. <laughs> Artie Sherman was given a life sentence in state court for murder. Borden and Fisher were convicted of conspiracy to violate the federal unlawful flight to avoid prosecution statute and as accessories and sentenced to serve 10 years in a federal penitentiary. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is a vital message on our nation's internal security from J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover's message is, and I quote, we have a twofold responsibility in preserving the nation's internal security. We must take all necessary measures to defend the country's secrets and vital areas from foreign spies and subversive groups within the country. But we also have the responsibility to preserve the civil liberties of the individual citizen. In a democracy, all effective countermeasures against subversives must be in accordance with a due process of law. There is no room for vigilante action or witch hunts. These lead only to hysteria. We must approach our task calmly and with an appreciation for the rights of the innocent. Otherwise, we may destroy the very thing we seek to preserve. Now a quick review of the equitable plan for men and women on the way up. Briefly, this plan is designed for those who intend to get ahead. For men who are sure that some fine day they'll be able to tell their wives... Hey, Helen, guess what? I've been promoted. And my salary's going up, too. Are you that kind of man? Then don't wait another day. Ask your equitable society representative to work out your own personal plan for a man on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, armed robbery. Its title, The Wild Pitch. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were B. Benaderet, Ross Delmar, Bill Johnstone, Charles Maxwell, Paul Richards, Victor Rodman, and John Sheehan. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The wild pitch on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.